Hello everybody, thank you for joining today's webinar, the third in the series of our Santander Business Breakthrough Events. Um, really looking forward to this one with a uh, fabulous guest with us today, Andrew Mulvena, who is the uh, co-founder of Bright Pearl, a business that I've tracked over many years and um, really looking forward to hear what he's got to say to us and, and the information and insight he's able to share with us today. Um, the subject for today is from founder to leader building big picture strategy um, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating subject as well so uh, I'm really keen to hear about how Andrew has um, gone through the journey that he's been through with Bright Pearl and, and how that's evolved not just for the business but for himself. Um, remember these uh, webinars are very much for you the listeners so we would welcome you to um, ask your questions uh, you've got 45 minutes to an hour now to ask anything you'd like to, to Andrew or myself. Um, you have a little section down on your control panel where you can add questions and um, we'll kick things off but then we'll quickly be uh, uh, making sure that we get everything that you would like to be asked. Um, asked. So um, without further ado, um, I'd love to ask Andrew just to introduce himself and Andrew if you could just tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Bright Pearl story to give everyone a bit of a background. Certainly. Thanks, Matt, for, for inviting me to join. And so Bright Pearl is a web-based software used by independent retailers, merchants, e-commerce businesses to organize the data in their business. One of the fantastic things that our software does is it, it helps retailers save time so they can focus on the things that they love, which is finding new products, developing new markets, and not spending time managing spreadsheets to track who their customers are, where their inventory is, what their profits like through different channels, different product lines. And it's a fantastic piece of software. It's used by thousands of e-commerce retailers. Um, our story has been an interesting one. We started a friend of mine at this, being a re retail hotel business ourselves, which we started at university. And out of frustration of the lack of software that helped us grow that business, we built our own. Um, we're fortunate that we have computer scientists and, and had the skills to do that. Very soon we realized that hey, there must be must be hundreds and thousands of other businesses like us getting fed up of using um, you know, bookkeeping packages like Sage and QuickBooks that can't afford decent software. Uh, so we launched Bright Pearl uh, as a software company. And the company has grown from Chris and I, the two founders, to over 100 employees between Bristol and San Francisco. Um, and uh, on that journey, we've raised $26 million from, from investors to help fund that expansion and the company continues to grow 100% year on year. So it's been an exhausting but a fun ride. Brilliant. Um, I think it's, it's been a, an amazing ride. I remember you, um, when we when we last met up in Bristol, I remember you telling me that you know, you'd know you gone from days of uh, sleeping in a boat and uh, uh, and kind of you know really making ends meet um, just to get the business kind of established and, and, and now you're running uh, you know, a, a multi country um, business that, that continues to expand rapidly. Um, mm. you know, how, do you, how do you look back on that, that kind of the gulf between the two? Well, you know, it's, every stage it's felt a little bit like C plus could do better. You know, we're a really ambitious uh, team um, and we just want to, we, we know there's hundreds of thousands of businesses out there facing the pain that we did originally and we really want our software to work for them. So you work very hard to achieve your dream achieve those dreams and, and yet you make you make sacrifices you know the, the, a lot of people go out uh, laughing having a having a laugh you know having a few having a few too many drinks yeah, but there's always somebody back at base working harder and they'll be the ones that are winning so we put a we, we had that view and we've, we've we've grasped it and we put everything into this that we could so unfortunately I did did mean that my uh, I, I lost you know I, I lost my home and um, and uh, someone lent me a boat and I lived uh, I lived on this very small smelly narrow boat in Bristol Harbour which I could barely stand up in and, the, and that was the year the harbour froze uh, sadly it didn't have heating so it got it got uncomfortable for a while and um, but you know with these with these times you, you have to people tell you you're mad but you have to believe in your vision and uh, you know, this is this is the, you know have conviction in your vision and don't listen to the naysayers and, and work hard to achieve that vision and and you know we did and we got a lot of really great customers um, who've been paying us good money since day one and we worked very hard to look after them and you know we were able to find good investors who have track record in software because they shared our vision they believed in our vision 
and they uh, fortunately had the had the, the cash willing to invest. So it helped to escort me get a home, uh, but more importantly, to to really invest in the business and take it to another level. And and kind of looking back at those early days, um, and and really your role and 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 that of your co-founder, can can you tell us a little bit about you know what was your role for say the first year of trading, you know, and and, and then how did that mm. start to start to evolve as the business started to take off? Yeah, happy to happy to talk, talk you through it. So it, it starts with with just two of us, and very quickly though, I put savings in, and we got to a team of six in a couple of months. And um, we knew we needed more people on deck to help with this. And um, my side, although I'm a software engineer by training, Chris took my co-founder and partner. He took responsibility for all that product design and building it. And um, I looked after sales, marketing, our partners and visiting customers set up the software, and then looking after those customers over the phone. Um, I also ran um, all the bookkeeping and financial side of the business. I did get involved around product design other, and, and some development. Um, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got feelings about that, so I, I do like to contribute. Now in time though, you go from, there's four levels of the business, workers, managers, directors, and shareholders. And for the first two years, very much working. You know, very little time managing, virtually no time directing the business, and zero time in thinking of the shareholder about how to add value for the business. So for two years, that, that's how it was until I raised, uh, we raised a million pound of seed investment from two uh, world-class investors, uh, Eden Ventures and Notion Capital, who have a track record in software history. You know, these, these guys were we we'll put the cash in. At that point, my role changed to scaling the teams out and running those teams, so more time as managers of those teams. Um, sorry, hiring the managers, so more time directing the managers. Um, and then in time, uh, once uh, I realized you know, this, the company has a, you know, a bigger financial outcome potential than, than I originally thought, we underestimated how potential of the business. Um, you know, we thought it right to bring in a hard-hitting CEO so at this point, I'm thinking more like a shareholder um, and, uh, and a director. So hiring the CEO, at that point, I still remain the general manager. You know, I've hired most people in the business at this point, and, and the managers of each team very much setting the culture and, and you know, how the company operates day to day kind of as a general manager. And then finally, the final change in my role was then going from a generalist role into owning a function. So the first... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I tend to, being the entrepreneur, I tend to own the function that doesn't exist, and my job is to build it. So the first one of those was um, was the U.S. and internationalization. So we had customers in 30 countries in the world in web-based software. We could people can sign up for anywhere in the world, but the U.S. to us is a really interesting market, just because there are so many businesses. So I was I took the role of expanding to the U.S. and so relocated to. San Francisco, California, at the heart of heart of software globally, and built a team there. And then, um, and then when I returned to the UK, I did the same again, and I looked at our partner channel channel sales basically, and built that function. Um, so US, I got to 30% of the company's revenue within six months or so. And then when I added the partner, I got that to about 40% of the company's revenue. Which you know, we're doing we're doing. Um, millions in revenue at this point, so it's you know trying to add value by getting big growth through new markets. And do you think that 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 kind of almost establishing and setting up a a, a department or a function um, is a bit that definitely plays to your I guess entrepreneurial strengths? And it, it, is that something you've identified in your in yourself? It, well, you know, you tend to you know if, you, if if there's a spectrum of things we do, um, a very small segment of that. You know, we're world class at. You know, we're really good at. Uh, you know, a, 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 an acceptable. You know, there's another segment that's a bit quite big that you know we're all right at. And then there's a, a vast segment of the stuff we do we're really not very good at. You know, perhaps you're so bad you could be fired. So what we need to do is figure out what are we really good at, and then hiring people and building teams to complement um, uh, to complement what you know what we're good at. So think about the early days. When I was running the sales team, the marketing team, the customer service team, first of all, you're too busy. But secondly, there are much better salespeople out there than, than me. And you know, there are much better marketeers as well. And then you know, people who have infinite, have infinite patience, who are you know, incredibly
me just doing customer service. So the, 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 the secret here of an entrepreneur is not just be a starter, but you need to learn how to finish through hiring the right team and organizational structures. So I'd say I am a yeah, good spot. I am there. I'm very good at building, building quickly. But um, you know, also my skill set. I think you know most successful entrepreneurs would say you, you need, or you need to have somebody who's very good at that, building the team out. And at that point, you identified that you you bring in a CEO, uh, and and was that something that you 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 saw coming? Was it something that was suggested to you? Um, at what point did you sort of realise? Because I think I think many startup entrepreneurs and and, and I've class myself as, as, as one of these at, at, at a really kind of at the early days you know you, you would you'd never envisage that someone else would, would I think certainly most people would never envisage that someone else is going to run the business and take it big if uh, almost uh, conversely you, you do a good job at the start mm, yeah, it's, it's a great, yeah it's a great point you know in the for those first couple of years where the six of us we've never we've never yeah, we never crossed our mind there'd be somebody else here running it because that's what we do right yeah well, it, 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 the penny dropped. The penny dropped for, for Chris and I when we realised the, the scale of, of, of the business that we, we that could be built, um, and we realised that you know, this this could be the Southwest first billion dollar software company. If, when we look at the numbers, we needed to add twenty thousand customers, you know, paying um, paying a certain amount a, a month, which. Uh, they were paying. We need. We have several thousand of them. But if we can get to twenty thousand in five years, that rate of growth and revenue would value. Uh, you know, software businesses valued about eight to twenty x of revenue. It could be worth a billion dollar company. Now, mm. you want to make the. If that's possible, how do you how do you how do you achieve that? Is it best to try and learn how to be a CEO, or is it best to hire a great CEO? Um. So this, I had that decision in front of me. So do I, basically, I, and I kind of reasoned it as, do I want sleepless nights about how to be a CEO, you know, how to hire a world-class executive team, how to manage world-class execs that are on you know, big payroll, big expectations? Or do I want sleepless nights about how to run the business and what's, well, what's stopping the business from being successful? And, you know, I, I chose the latter because it means that if, if the company is struggling somewhere, I can focus on making sure and helping the company to succeed in the areas where it's struggling. And that can be at all parts of the organization. So I, I think it's, it's a very powerful position to, to be a founder that's able to step back from day to day running the company and find better people to do that. And a, a, a great role model for me is Richard Branson, who, who has a portfolio you know, of hundreds of, of companies. And you know, he has the ideas. Um, he knows the culture and the vision, uh, but he hires great people to execute that, and that's that's, that's what I'd like to do. And um, this, this is a question that's coming already, and it's coming from several people. So if you, um, if guys, if you uh, make sure that you get asking your questions, we'll definitely come to them and try and get everybody's questions answered. Um, it's coming from several people. Um, make sure you leave your names and your company names if you'd like me to read them out. Um, but it's a fairly obvious one. Um, how do you go about hiring the best talent as a small company? Um, so mm. it'd be really good to hear a kind of a, a general answer in, in sort of Bright Pills kind of hiring strategy, especially for kind of I guess senior management talent. But but also that how you you know how did you go and find that first um, CEO would be my yeah. sort of follow-on question. Yeah, so I think you know there's a couple of specific specific lessons that that I share. Um, and I think it's uh, one relates to early stage, one towards later stage. So earlier stage, I think I made the mistake of hiring too junior in our first set of hires, and that meant that later on, when I had to hire managers and executives, I had to look to people outside the organisation rather than promoting from within. Now, we actually have our, our best leaders now. The company are the ones we did promote from within. If when I and, and right now I'm looking at building more companies, and what I'll do is when I start my team, I'm going to look for seriously talented individuals um, as part of my opening team. Now that doesn't mean experience or expensive, but I want people who are super bright and are going to work tirelessly and believe in my vision or the vision we have for the company. So 
the nose folk of bright pearl in the early team uh, that we found that have those skills and attributes are the ones now running running the company, literally running the company. And they've been promoted through from, in one case, an individual sales rep to now being the, the lead running all commercial for, for, for bright pearl. So I'd say we may, we may have hired two junior too early, so look for seriously talented seriously talented people who can who could run the company in the future. Now they are very, it's very hard to find. So you will need we do need to hire in executives. So the best way the best one I've found to do that is um, is using search partners. So the recruitment industry you know, takes takes a lot of grief. Um, the right search partner and I describe them as search partners, not a recruiting agency. The right search partner, you know, will do a specific search for a certain uh, certain role. So, and I've been part of ten of these executive searches, from CEO um, to to SVP level, senior vice presidents of, of the U.S. operations. So, fairly hefty hefty bills. And given the potential of the business, you know, I want to know I've got the best individuals in those roles. And by finding a finding the right search partner. That gives me confidence and also speed to get the person. So a search partner will leave, you know, a, a quality headhunter will leave no stones unturned to find really great candidates for for you, um, and then we'll run a process to 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 find, you know, to place someone quickly. And um, it's not cheap. You know, in the U.S., they actually ask for a you know, percent. The, the the search partner will ask for a percent of the equity that we we give to the candidate. So. You know, the search partner will own part of the business. You know, it sounds expensive, but I think that's a good thing because they're aligned in the outcomes of the business. So, i.e., if they find the right person and our share value rockets, they benefit as a result. So, search partners, and there is a process then that you you have to work with the search partner to do. So, I'll just quickly quickly give an overview of that. So, it starts with you know, we, we were hiring a CEO or you know senior level. Is, is a very humbling experience because of the quality of the candidates you get through. I mean, here's, here's me who's never run a company before, um, and I'm having uh, MDs and CEOs of household names, you know, head of marketing of, of uh, you know, one of the biggest software companies in the U.S. applying to, to us. So I need I need support in this, and I do this by having the first call actually uh, with with candidates as one of our investors. He's super credible and sold the business for a lot, lot of money. So I'd be saying, who in your network can help you add credibility? And the purpose in the, the first call is with a candidate is to really sell the company. You know, make them make them want to, you know, do whatever they can to work for you. <laughs> you know, to really sell the company, and then enter a process where uh, of of, uh, of selection, where it's not just you interviewing with a panel, then. You know, you have to spend a lot of time and money on that process, but for us, it's delivered uh, great results. You know, we've got a really solid team at Bright Pearl. Brilliant. I think some some great advice there. Um, could you just give us some specifics about how you actually went about bringing in the CEO and and probably, I guess, the transition period for me is an is an interesting subject. Um, I guess you were looking for the right individual, obviously, but then also there's the there's got to be some kind of chemistry and and an agreed. Uh, agreed format for working between yourselves as co-founders and, and the new guy coming in. How did that all kind of work itself out? Yeah, make, makes sense. I think there's a couple of, things, couple of questions in there, Matt. One is kind of some, some specifics about what we look for in a candidate, then how do we, the right candidate, and how do we integrate them in the company? Um, so, so firstly, uh, you know, cultural fit um, is, is, is essential. So it's better to have someone who's a lot less experienced, and but, the, but, the, but who is super keen. Everyone's got to be super keen and capable, but is the right fit. So we turned down individuals who were, you know, the CVs were much stronger than people who we hired in the end. But we hired the ones we did because, um, first of all, we believed they were as capable, if less experienced. But most importantly, they were, they were a tight, tight. They could become part of a tight knit team. So for me, that. You know, having a close team is, is is vital, and that's come from bad experience actually of, of placing um, you know placing an exec executive who wasn't a great cultural fit and um, was always separate from the team and you know his, his days were numbered really from from the beginning. That's a mistake we made because we didn't recognise the importance of that cultural fit. 
bit. So, so yeah, looking for really, and that comes down to personality at the end of the day. So you only need to know that from time with them. So make the selection process, you know, it, you know, it, 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 you know invest time into it, you know, make it intimate, you get to know the people. Um, so what in California, what, what I actually did is, you know, if people weren't from the area, we'd pay for a hotel and put them up for three nights and we do we do stuff with them to kind of get to know get to know each other and that led to, you know, some cases going yes, in other cases going definitely no. Um, so the next, yeah, the next thing is um, I think the second part of your question was around that transition then, bringing in new leaders, how do you hand over responsibility to them? Yeah. And, um, you know that that that's that's tricky for for both the incoming and the uh, the incoming and the person who has to let go of responsibility. So as a founder who's you know, been, a, been a pivotal part of building out the company, you know, you've got to get out of the way. And you have to give that individual space to succeed or fail. And if they are making mistakes, you have to not you know, be respectful um, about their decision and not be second guessing them. And actually let mistakes let mistakes happen. That's part of the learning process. Um, so real, really staying away from the day-to-day -day involvement and being clear on what outcomes on a quarterly, annually basis you expect. Um, but at the same time, be part of the business and be part of finding solutions. Um, it, it, it is tricky, but it nets down as you know, the person who's in the business already really has to, has to let go, get out of the way, be seen to get out of the way, and, and have that conversation and recommend, you know, say, and be upfront, you know, about our weaknesses. Everyone can see our weaknesses already, right? And they're talking about them, most likely. Mm. So the best thing we can do is actually surface them and say, look, I'm sorry, I keep on saying this, or, or butting it in this, this way, or, you know, I just can't help getting involved here. I apologize. Can you help me to, you know, get out of the way in these areas, perhaps? And, you know, it, it, things go a lot easier when the conversation's out on the, on the table. Absolutely. Um, we've got um, a, another question. It's from um, Greg Lander. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, Greg Lander, who runs Lander Books, um, and he would like to ask: um, Would you use search partners looking for technical staff and development teams? Um, it, I, I guess you would. I don't know. Is that is that true? So. Technical teams are, are hard, hard to recruit just because demand for, 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 for demand is increasing. You know, the, the, the software sector, the digital sector is booming right now. That means more businesses being created, and you know we have a tragically in the UK we have a we have a, a lack of engineering and engineering talent available. Yeah, you know, university engineering degrees aren't popular, which is which is very sad. So in those market conditions, you've got to do something different. Okay, if we, if we imagine you're in America. Americans will spend as much as they can to give themselves the best chance of success. They're, owned, they're obsessed with their their personal their company success, and I think we a lot of we can learn from that. So rather than trying to protect the downside, by not putting money in because it might not work out, we should think about how we can do more to give ourselves the best chance. Technology underpins success of all business, most of pretty much all businesses nowadays, as well as the business model, you need to go to market strategies, but you know, you've got to have the tech in place. So I think it's worth, you know, find the right tech resource. And, you know, when you've got it, your life becomes so much, so much easier. Um, so what you do, um, I mean, I, I absolutely love a, a recruitment agency called uh, People Source, out run out of, out of Bristol, but got a London office and global as well. These guys do, do an awesome job. It's not cheap, so think about going direct as well. When you're going direct, remember what I said before about attracting senior level talent. That same goes for you know the most junior, um, the most junior tech resource uh, or tech or developer. You know they might be you know up and coming rock star of digital leader tomorrow. So how do you how do you um, make your company appeal to those, that really young talent? Um, and, you know, those that are five years, you know, five years into their career, which is a, a sweet spot of so becoming a perhaps a senior level developer. So I think it's, you know, what does your career page look like? When you're advertising a job, you know, have, you know, two to five lines about you and make not just your company, 
but your team and your market sound really sexy. So these folks want to you know, kill a grandma to work for you. And um, you have a video there that shows that about company culture, pictures of people. You know, and then actually deliver on this promise. So make invest in people, um, and there's, there's, there's a few things you can do to really help um, you know people rave about your company once you work there. Firstly, I mean, you know we've grown so fast actually we struggle to do these things, and so we've learned them from bitter experience of actually not in some cases you know not investing our people in, in, in as much as we should. I mean we do now. We all have to go on that journey of learning. Um, but you know, a really clear, clear career development framework. You know, how you how you're going to support your engineers to when they're junior or grad get to the you know developer level, and then from the developers, how do you support them to get to a senior developer? And um, so, you know, these these kind of things really appeal to us. You know, because when we get a you know when when we're reporting to one boss, we want to know what do I have to do to be you know get get scored five out of five or you know A this quarter in order to get the annual payment or um, salary increase or bonus. So I think that, um, I think so attracting talent, you know, recruiters like, great recruiters like people source, you know, only work, only find the best, you know, do your due diligence for them, ask around who people work with, you know, who was good, why. Um, and secondly, go direct, advertise it everywhere you can, and use LinkedIn, mind LinkedIn, um, to, to go direct, try and get some candidates yourself, and then thirdly, you know, really make make your company from the outside look great, uh, but also deliver on that and, and create a great great company to work for. Uh, it's really interesting you um, talking about kind of reporting, and I'd love to hear about how you I don't know how the, how as an organisation you manage your kind of reporting of um, uh, I, I guess management information and, and and how that works. So if you're you're obviously still the co-founders, you know, significant shareholders, and you know, it's still very much your business, even though as a CEO running it, and you've got you've got investors mm. in the business. How mm. how does that information still come back to you guys as co-founders? Um, so, in 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 what sense are you asking that? So is this, you know, is, now I'm not involved day to day. What kind of information do I get, or or how do you? Is this a bigger question about? How do we communicate between levels of, of a company? Um, I think I probably meant both, really. the, the former, but I think both would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it all, I think trans transparency transparency is really important. So, when when working, you know, working really hard in the business and reporting to investors, you sometimes think, well, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to share this, I don't want to share that. You know, you want you want to sell. You always want want to put that stuff forward. So we want to show. Um, highlight the figures that are doing really well, but at the same time, we never hide the things that aren't, we're not doing well at, because if we want to be that, that that global software company, we've got to we've got to do well on all fronts. So we want to know where we're doing badly, and get that in front of the board and the senior management team, and also you know, every employee, and say, team, this is where our customer satisfaction is is slipped to here. Uh, what are, what are we going to do to get it up? Uh, get it back back to where it was, and even even higher. And here's our thoughts, you know, management team's thoughts. But we involve every level in um, in exposure to how the company is doing, and um, and then also the plans on how we're going to fix it. And anyone can comment about them on this, and you know, we get some amazing amazing feedback. And I think to 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 do that, it all starts actually by having a you know a, a set of metrics or KPIs to measure the business. You know, if, you don't, if you don't have those, you're kind of flying blind. Um, so I'd be thinking hard about what are the metrics to to measure your business. So you know, you know how you're doing. Are you, you know, are you achieving what, what you set out to do in terms of um, your revenue, your profitability, your growth in adding number of new customers, your growth in adding new revenue each month, and um, how you're doing in terms of customer satisfaction. You know, um, we use the Net Promoter Score. That's the most effective way of measuring customer service I, I, at least I've seen it. It's superb. I'd say everybody should do that with their customers, um, and then really take that seriously. You know, if your if your customers if your, if your customers aren't happy, you know, don't try and sell more. Figure figure out what it is you need to do and make them happy, and then invest in those customers and get them happy before you try and get more. So there's you know there's a set of metrics for every business. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. 
then with those metrics, a way to, in a, in a, fun, in a fun way as well, in, in, a, in a not completely boring way, at, engage, have the company engage with them, um, you know, and then, then pull together to, to, put, to, to put together plans. And I suppose that would bleed into then how do you actually all, how do you set objectives across a company? But uh, that's, that's, that's probably a different, different question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a, another couple of questions. Um, sure. The first one is from um, Lily Simpson. Um, Lily, uh, remember to uh, let us know what, what company you're from, but um, she would like to know um, what financial incentive have you offered new CEOs? So obviously, um, don't want to reveal anything too sensitive that you can't, but if you can give us a broad overview of the kind of considerations that you would make when, uh, when appointing such a position. So, uh, thanks for the question, Lily. Re really important that the, the whole team is um, focused on the outcome you want and are sufficiently vested. You know that they feel rewarded for that. And um, you know, there's a base. There's a base. This is kind of a base set that you, know, you want to cover off, I'd say. But also, this varies very much on the person. So, there may be um, you know desire for wealth now. Um, and in some cases, there, actually, there really isn't. Um, but there is a desire for wealth in the future. So, you know, XT taking having XT in the company will uh, fuel uh, wealth in the future. Having a big salary uh, will will fuel the wealth now. So it's a, they're the two major major players, major components or variables that you can play with. Um, but I'd be so when we bring in people into Bright Pearl, we very much sell the vision of this is where we want to go. Um, and being a startup, actually, often we can't pay the, the market rate. So what we'll do is articulate that you know, we're going to give you this equity, and this equity, we're hoping the company will be worth X amount when the company is, as a whole is worth Y. Um, so you know, we, people are, they understand the vision, they buy into it, they want to be part of helping us get there, and then they're rewarded for having got us there. And a note on equity, so this isn't, you know, when a company's formed, there's generally a thousand shares, um, or you know, for a penny each issued. That's your, you know, your ordinary shares. That's your equity, and you can then just give that to somebody. But I don't, don't do that. I recommend uh, putting in place an option scheme um, with uh, with with employees. Because option schemes allow you to basically invest over time. So if actually, you know, you, like like everyone does pick the wrong person, you know, you do have occasionally make mistakes. You, know, you can actually, you, you don't issue all the shares. Um, so option schemes allow you to issue them over time. So if someone stays for four years, then they get all their options. Or you can perhaps uh, vest them against performance. So if you get the company to a certain level, then you get um, this, this equity, um, or the option to buy the equity. So it's, uh, and there's lots of tax, tax incentives to do that. So speak to your, speak to your accountant um, or, or an advisor. On how to structure that, but I'd say that that's the two main things: is the equity and then and then salary. Um, I mean, on salaries in the go-to-market side of the company, so sales and marketing, and um, that's always structured as a base plus commission. That's a major incentive there. CEOs, um, at, you know, quite often, quite often will you know will have a bonus on hitting targets, but they'll have a high base, and it's you know the, the ratio based to uh, to, um, to commission is, is, is actually less. It's more weighted towards the base because you want the you don't want the CEO to struggle to pay the bills because you know you've not hit target. You want to be comfortable, 100% focused on figuring out why you've not hit target and getting to target. So that, that's my view. My view on that. Okay, brilliant. Um, I would love to hear just a, a little bit more about kind of the big picture strategy. So, can you talk to us about? You know where you've got to in the, in the last 12 months with the business, and where you're looking to drive forward. I know you talked about the the US expansion, but what does the future of Bright Pill look like? Sure. So what was the what was the first part of the question, Matt? I, I missed that. The so, B2B strategy, did you say? No, sorry. I, I'd love to know just what the strategy has been for the last 12 months, and you know what it will be for the next for the next couple of years. Okay. So um, yes. So. I mean, we have we have multiple channels which we go to market. So a channel for us might be um, 
we, we, we have we have six actually. So we have uh, basically they reflect the six the six teams we have in the company on the go to market side. So inbound, outbound, and partnerships. So you know, as a business, we um, we we have a marketing team. They produce awesome content around how to run a multi-channel business. You know, have, and there's some really great advice in those. You know, we'll, we'll issue a, a blog or a white paper, and uh, you know, at least every other day, quite often it's every day. So a lot of a lot of our potential customers are, are reading and reading our materials and you know, benefiting from that advice. Now one day they'll get some software. So we hope by you know, they'll remember our name and come back to take out a trial of our software. And that's the inbound team are basically looking after the people who are getting in touch with us to take out trials. So we phone everyone takes a trial. We try and call everybody that takes a trial just to say thanks and figure out what it is that they, they're trying to achieve and if we're the right software to help them. If we're not, we figure that out quite quickly and give them advice on where to look. Because you know, no software does everything. So we've got to figure out what's right and what's wrong. Other channels be uh, our partners. So Bright Pearl, we find our, our customers, you know, when they're building a website, they'll go to a web design agency and use a great package like Magento or Shopify to power the e-commerce store. And when that website starts succeeding and the orders are rolling in, they'll want to embrace other channels. So, you know, why aren't they setting up an eBay store, an Amazon store? What about going into a French market that's, that's very under, underserved? And now as an e-commerce designer, well, how do I how do I keep those stores up to date? I, I'm, I'm happy you're going to build them. They'll look great. You know, they'll fall in love with these new stores. But the inventory levels are out to date. Then where do I go to process the orders? So those web designers need a solution, and they recommend recommend Bright Pearl. So you know, we spend a lot of time um, getting to know the web design agencies, and and you know we just want to inform them what we do, and then. Um, you know, make sure they remember us. So we do some. We're always at, at the e-commerce event. I'm actually at Retail Week live right now, and uh, you know, I speak to a lot of web design agencies. Um, you know, we've got thousands of retailers who need good design agencies. So it's, it's very much two-way. So you know, we they create listings on a website, and we recommend them. You know, every day. Uh, uh, you know, we're constantly recommending web design agencies. Then the final, the final of the three channels is outbound. So we'll also you know, want to reach out and get in touch with uh, uh, with e-commerce agencies to let them know let them know we're here. So, you know, outbound, some, some think of just cold calling and and, and uh, you know pushy salesmen. That's not what we do. There's more sophisticated techniques that have taken us years to develop, but they you know, they do work. And it's it's really starts with understanding who your buyer are and what you can do to help them and just having a conversation and not expecting an instant close. It's about a relationship, understanding that at some point, you know, they'll want to move all their business systems to the cloud, like we all moved, moved our music to the cloud. You know, we all make our own decision when it's right, and that's what, right, that's what we'll do. We just want to be, you know, we want them to know about us at the point where they do choose to move to the cloud and, and take a trial out. And then finally, the, the, I mentioned six channels, inbound, outbound partner, we do all the same in the U.S. Uh, so we're very focused UK, US markets. Brilliant. Um, we have uh, one question, which is a bit of a diversion from uh, from uh, uh, the subject we've just been on, but nonetheless, we should answer it. So um, this one's from Paula Kemp, um, and she would like to know: um, uh, Do you take on interns, and um, how does this work for you? Um, do you have a do you have a strategy for getting the most from in, from internships or um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Mm. Um, good question. So, interns, we have, uh, yeah, so we we work with people early stage in their career, absolutely. In our in our sales team, we had a graduate program running that worked re really well for us. So, we actually worked with a specialist grad recruiter who had already pre interviewed and selected. So, we already had a good candidate base to do our interviews in. And um, these weren't technically interns. They, you know, were grads looking for the first job, um, and then we help accelerate their careers into, you know, being great salespeople. You know, it doesn't work out in sales for anybody in the company. If, if it's not working out in their role, we, you know, we'll know that quite quickly because we're a very close company. And the first thing we do is, you know, Brightpool is like a family. You know, we don't just let people go. We always try and find other work for them. So, 
you know, we've, we've moved, you know, people move around all the time in Bright Pearl. It's amazing to see the number of promotions that people get in the company, um, which is awesome. In terms of internships, we've done a couple of those that have worked in our technology teams, and they've uh, some, of our, some of our best developers joined actually as an intern at the university. But to be honest, that's not an area we're focused on um, in internships. It's more the, the graduates, uh, graduates, and then you know senior posts, and then building programs to, to attract people into those posts. Brilliant. Um, I think we're uh, pretty close to wrapping up. Have we got any uh, final questions? I'm uh, just looking over at Nima, who is managing the questions. Okay, so we've got one more coming in. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's just on big picture, and this is one that came in um, came in via Twitter. It's um, how, who decides who decides the big picture strategy that we've talked about. Is it is it you or the CEO? And and I guess that's a, that's an interesting um, question, isn't it? You know, who who ultimately decides the direction of the business? Mm, yeah, great. It, that, that's a great great question. So you know, everybody has opinions. Uh, of where it should go, and every opinion is is really valid because it comes out of their experience. So, you know, the most junior of customer service reps um, in the company you know, will have opinions about what should we should be doing next, and that's all part of the strategy. So we spend a we spend a lot of time working and deciding what that strategy is. Ultimately, there's only so long you can spend collecting data and collecting information to inform decisions, and you've got to make a decision. And the CEO's job is to run that process quickly. So it's you know it isn't you're not shooting from the hip here. We're not just making gut decisions. When the, the, the CEO needs to run a business that um, that makes quick decisions that are well informed by data and experience, and that experience, like I said, comes from um, all levels all levels of the business. That's what a great CEO does. Brilliant. Um, we've got a question from um, from Rose Hill, uh, and she, she she would like to know that um, really just kind of exploring how you both started out as partners in the business. So she mm -hmm. is looking at, um, at I think from the from the phrasing of the question, she would she's interested. She's running a business on her own. Is interested in taking on a partner. So um, what, mm -hmm. what what did you find as the benefits of having a partner on board as opposed to if you did it on your own? I'm um, definitely. Definitely find partners. You're much stronger as a team. Um, so I work a lot of lot of time now with um, um, with startups, particularly um, uh, you know, particularly around the, the London Silicon Roundabout scene. You know, it's you know, it, 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 it's incredible companies coming out every day. The best companies, the most backable companies, have a team. You'll have a developer that's going to who's awesome at producing you know full stack tech. Have a designer that makes this product awesome to use and feel with, uh, to sorry, awesome to use for its consumers, B two B to B or B two C, and then finally they're going to have the, the deal maker. So it's the three Ds: developer, design, deals. And um, one person can't do all of that, and role sharing becomes inefficient very quickly. Having people who are having people as co-founders who have experience. Or perhaps just you know serious capabilities, but not yet experienced. So they're really in their career. Um, actually, in some ways, that's, that's better as a co-founder. You know, some, exp some experience there is, is, is validation they can do it. But having those different those different skills around the table with you takes takes a lot of pressure off you. <coughs> Excuse me, as the main founder, so you don't have to work out. You know, you go to market strategy. You don't have to figure out can I you know do I work with the developer. In a, an offshore location like Eastern Europe or India, or you know, how do you write a product specification anyway? Or you know, you know, I just don't like the look of this, but I'm not sure how to make this app look better. You know, facing those challenges by yourself is, I'd, I'd suggest, very difficult. All the great companies have co-founders. Richard Branson has in in his businesses, um, you know, everything from from Facebook to you know to Twitter. Um, you know, they all have a team in there. Sometimes you don't you don't hear of the co-founders. So you know, you know so Steve Jobs, co-founder in, in Apple, was was fairly quiet. Um, I recently watched an interview by Mark Benioff, co-founders at Salesforce. That's a company doing billions in revenue. And, 
it looks like it's all Mark's gig, but actually you know, there's, there's a team that was with him at the beginning that made it possible um, as much as him. So I'd, I'd really recommend looking for those those people. And you know, personality is important. You need to be able to get on and work, work together. Um, you know, so so you know, choose 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 wisely. Um, and yeah, don't don't rush that to get to know people. Um, yeah, any more? You know, to find out more about that, I'd really recommend for connecting with your local, just your local a startup ecosystem. Um, you know, if you're a technology business, you know, I recommend finding your local um, you know, technology incubator or accelerator. They're often called. So in the southwest, there's two sets. One called Set Squared, one called Web Start. You know, in London, there's a lot. But if you if you go along to the events they do, you'll be in a room with Twenty to two hundred other people who are passionate about building a business, and yeah, that enthusiasm and, and DNA is uh, you know, is, 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 is all over there. So it's a good good place to start looking. Yeah, absolutely, I agree, and I think um, definitely the the businesses that we see at Smarter are uh, uh, are all kind of team led. The, the, even if, as you say, that it looks like there's one prominent founder, it's quite often a strong <clears> team around them. And uh, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, and some some great events to go out and find that, and just really find someone who shares shares your passions really, and and that's the great place to start, and then start looking at the skill sets. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely right. Okay, we have one more time. We've probably got time for it. Um, okay, so um, these are this is a, a fairly basic question, but it's 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 based around. Um, Sorry, it's based around business ideas. So it's um, how do you, how do you, what would you do if you come up with an idea, a new idea now? So what would you, what would you do differently if you started now? So it's, it's, it's this question about how would I, how would I select my idea, or what would I do differently when? No, what would you, what, what, yeah, what if anything would you do differently if you, were, I guess, if you were starting Bright Pearl again now, or if you came up with a, if you, if you had a startup now. Uh, and I guess we can we can use this as a kind of a, a parting piece of advice. Okay. Yeah, happy to. So, I, you know, I think here the, the the most important thing I've learned is is just about really understanding what a big market looks like. Um, so I I'm, I'm I'm advising 20 to 30 businesses now, and you know when I the most exciting businesses I see that I advise or I read about. Are the ones where there's a, a huge number of potential users, a big market, and and what's really important about that is that there is a significant pain or frustration that exists by most people in this market that's being underserved. Ideally, that they piece of technology or service that they're using that they hate, um, but a lot, a lot of people are frustrated. And then when you introduce your product or service, you don't need to evangelize. What it does, why it's good. The moment the market sees it, they go, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I get that. That's something I need." So, real get really, you know, we all believe our products are are wonderful and health, and they and they are. And um, but I would, you know, I really I'm questioning now on, you know, what what's our that's how I that's how I question basically and, uh, and, and look at new ideas is how big is that market? What's the under what's the underlying pain? Um, that needs to be fixed, and then then you you can build the product. But I think it starts with a market analysis. Brilliant, thank you. And and just as a, a kind of a final question before we wrap up, going back sure. to the uh, the title of, of of this business management webinar, uh, from founder to leader, um, what would be your uh, one piece of advice to to those people right at the at the point of takeoff with their businesses? So they've already established, and now they're looking to scale and expand. Um, what would be your uh, your advice to them um, when they're when they're looking ahead at executing on a on a business plan for growth? It has to be it has to be team. You know, don't compromise. Um, always look for for world class players. Um, and if you struggle to find, you know, get people to help you to do that. You know, if you're if you're like me and you live in a you know re regional part of the country, um, you know, no, you're you're nobody. You know, we we and in many ways we still are nobody, but you know, we definitely were back then. It's very hard to attract and to get people around you who can help attract that world-class talent. And, and and you know what, you're 
there are, there are a lot of better people out there than us doing the job. So you definitely need a humility when um, when when approaching working with people. But at the same time, you, know, you need more confidence in your vision than than anybody else. Um, you know, and you've got to be the one that that, that believes it and can you know, lead people across across the desert trying to find water if need be. Um, so that's that's it. I'd say great people remember your humility, but remember your vision when people tell you you're crazy. You know, work harder and stay focused, um, and, and you know, and eventually you win. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, hope you found it as um, as informative and useful as I did. I was actually scribbling notes at the same time as uh, listening to Andrew's responses <laughs> and thinking about next questions because it's um it's it's wholly relevant to us as a business as well. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I'm sure you are. Uh, all found it just as useful as I did. Um, we will be uh, emailing out everybody uh, a recording of the session um, and uh, also letting you know when our next events are, uh, when our next business management webinars are as part of this um, program with Santander Breakthrough. Um, and we all look very much to, um, to uh, seeing you again in the future. Um, Andrew, thank you very much. Matt, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, we'll bring the webinar to a close. Thank you.